level weight. My gunshots will make you levitate. Oh, in the summer, it's a blast for sure. But there's only like two months of summer. And then the whole rest of the time is winter. Um, any, oh, sorry. Okay, we're on now. Uh, welcome back to the Marshall Media Podcast. I'm Jake Brosnan, your host. Joined in studio, as always, is our lovely producer, Ria. And we have Diana Anasanto on the show. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. I'm doing great. Uh, uh, happy belated Christmas. Yes. So. Oh, I, that's yes, that's awesome. right. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everyone. Yes. I was going to wear a little Santa hat. But I, I just I, I advise I against it. Yeah, I didn't yeah, want to mess this up. Cool it it takes a while to work this quaff, you know, so I didn't want to ruin it. So, uh, so you've had a lot of stuff going on. You're a busy lady. And, I, you know, it's I've been wanting to get you on for a while because as far as is prominent women in the martial arts community, there's a short list of names and you are at the top of that list. So uh, just Aww. thank you so much for, for taking the time to uh, to come on. Thank you. I, I feel very honored. I really appreciate that. So, so you know. what, um, like, what are when you're when you're growing when you grow up in the environment that you did? I'm always curious because I just told you I have three daughters, and they some of them are at the ages. I started training them when they were about three years old, and they get to that phase where they go, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to train anymore. I don't want to do this. So I was really curious to talk to you. What what did your parents start you with, and how? I mean, did, was there ever a point when you were like, "I'm, I don't want to do this, Dad. I don't want to, I don't want to go in and do this." I mean, did yeah, you go well, through that phase? Yeah, I get so many dads that ask me this question. Um, listen, my my dad, first of all, uh, a lot of people probably don't know this. He was actually uh, a school teacher, and he taught PE, he taught English, and he taught history. So he kind of knew, you know, fun, creative ways to to motivate me as his daughter. So uh, he made it like like a game. And by the way, three is a good age. You know, I mean, obviously, you have to kind of check in with your child and see if they have a certain kind of, you know, uh, maturity, you mm -hmm. know, because you don't want them going around their schoolyard and punching kids or something, you know. Right. But um, but no, dad made it like a game. And so, I mean, I remember as a kid, I would be playing with my Barbie dolls. And, yeah, once in a while, I would get annoyed when he would, you know, infringe on my Barbie doll time. But... <laughs> You know, other times, you know, he just said, hey, honey, you know, let's uh, let's play. And he would always hold his hands and, you know, maybe grab a focus mitt or uh, sometimes he would pick the most, uh, you know, unusual locations like a restaurant. I would I would remember sitting next to him at Denny's or something or IHOP and he would take a butter knife and he would say, honey, so now how would we disarm this? And literally in Denny's. <laughs> He's teaching me how to, you know, as I'm trying to eat my pancakes, That's awesome. a butter knife, you know, and, you know, and it was just kind of, he would sneak it in at the most interesting time. So, so it wasn't like a class, like he didn't have you take classes or was it all no. private training? It was all private. See, he that's the way private, to do it. Right. Yeah. And he made it like a game. So I didn't know that I was being trained. When so. did you finally start getting into the classroom format? You know, I had, well, um, actually, once when I was five or six years old, I had somebody attack me, uh, one of the kids, a bully. And um, by that time in Carson, California, uh, my father, along with my, my second godfather figure, Richard Gillial, had helped build this entire, uh, this huge structure in the backyard. So he was already taking like backyard students and there were already formal uh, classes going on. So I just thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to join that class. And I remember like after my this event with me when I was five or six years old, where I had two to three girls like trying to beat me up. I was like, dad, I want to get in there and I want to train now. And so I remember my dad like, like. 20 minutes before class was supposed to, his class was supposed to begin. I'm stretching out and all the, the guys are starting to, you know, slowly walk in and he's telling them what happened. But, uh, so I guess you could say that was my first introduction. He kind of just would, you know, throw me in with the men because. You so you were with adults. This wasn't a kid's class. Oh yeah. No, no kid's class. I was with the adults. Always, <laughs> always with the adults. High standards. And, yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, but it was kind of nice because, um, you know, back at that time, we're talking people like Chris Kent, you mm -hmm. know, um, we're talking later on, like Jeff Amato. These are all 
people I grew up around. And so they became like my big brothers mm-hmm. or my uncles. So I had a lot of uncles and a lot of brother figures. And sometimes they would just, you know, whether it was 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or just, you know, just a couple minutes, they would maybe kick or spar with me. And then, you know, mm-hmm. maybe if I got bored, I would walk out or I could jump back in. So, you know, that's kind of how it was you know, I was molded to, to grow up around this. See, that's a good way. Cause that's one thing that I always, I struggle with, with my girls is like, we, cause we have this school and there's classes that go on, but at the same yeah. like, I feel like other people's children get the best of me. Uh, not the, you know, but I mean like I, yeah. I work 14 hour days and I'm always teaching classes. So I'm spending time teaching classes with all these other people's kids, but I don't get that personal right. time to spend with my own. And, right. and so I have them in classes but I, I, I always go, oh, you know what, I need to spend more time with them in the backyard and, and, you know, making it a game and fun for them. But it's just finding the time to do it that's so hard. And I start beating myself up about it because I feel like that same thing where it's almost like you, th- they have the feeling sometimes like, oh, I have to do this even though I don't want to. And so finding right. that right tone, that right atmosphere for them is yeah. going to be a challenge. Well- I will say this because that's actually a common situation I see with a lot of martial arts school owners. Mm. Um, and I, I, I look at it almost like being like um, the preacher's kid or the minister's kid. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Yeah. Um, and um, and so sometimes what I recommend, too, is make sure you allow your kids to also have other activities and, and participate. So later on, as I got older, I, I did baseball I played football because I was a tomboy Mm -hmm. um then I later on became a cheerleader and dad would come and support me at the games although he was kind of bummed out you know yeah cheerleader now (laughs) (laughs) but you know um and I was you know I got into dance so I think it helps when you are a martial arts teacher to just encourage your child's uh, other interests as well and then a lot of times you'd be surprised they'll come back and I there was a time where I didn't even want to come back to martial arts. I remember when like when Brandon was alive, I called him up because at that time I was now 17 or 18 and I, I wanted to focus more on the you know theater arts. And Brandon's like, yeah, me too. I don't want to do this. I just want to act. And um, but it's kind of funny, you know, how I came full circle and and then found my roots again as a martial artist. When did that happen? Like what what I mean, if you, you kind of lost your passion for a little bit, which I, I would think like I get this with teenagers all the time. When teenagers come in, they have such a natural physical ability. I mean, teenagers are so ripe to mold. And <laughs> but attitude wise, especially nowadays, they have a really tough time focusing on anything for any period of time. So I have so many teenagers that come in that show so much potential, yeah. but then they drift off or they get into girlfriends or boyfriends or cruising around and doing this. So, I mean, what brought you back in those teenage years? Well, for me, okay, so my so up until probably I was 15, 14, 15, I was training, and then I started slowly uh, you know, pulling away, doing dancing, doing cheerleading. But for me, uh, my dad, you know, he just said, I got to let go because if I push this too much, I, it, I'm going to probably lose her forever to this, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and now he gave me, he did focus when I was a child on giving me the real basic foundation. Cause he goes, I want you to at least have a taste of your culture Uh, you know, uh, your heritage. And I want you to be able to protect yourself in case I'm not around just some basic things that I think are important. And, and so he made sure he drilled that into me, you know, just enough where, and and gave, you know, to, to give me the the necessary instincts, you know, if I'm walking around to kind of, you know, to, to run or, and if I'm in a situation, you know, um, he was a huge advocate on making sure like, you know, I hate to say this, but, you know, uh, you know, G, um, you know, poking people's eyes out. Oh yeah, get it done. Get it done. It it sounds so gross. Not that I encourage this, but I mean. um, Pop the grape. Yeah, yeah, right? So, uh, (laughs) Fuji, right? Uh, As we say in uh, Jun Hong Gung Fu. But, um, but, you know, at one point he did have to just pull back and kind of let me find my, 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 my own path. And, and I'm glad he did. And so when I came back to the martial arts in my, early 20s um by that time i was a single mom with an autistic child 
uh, who was three to four years old, and I needed something. And um, my grandmother, um, who had recently passed away, uh, you know, basically would always say, you know, it, it's nice if you can come back to it. And I met, in fact, I remember having dreams about her, and I, and it was the best thing, you know, I call it my subconscious probably calling to me, and I did. I came back to the martial arts, and I started training at my dad's academy um, again, and then I was training with all my, uh, my different students under my father, um, and on and off. And, and then that's kind of how Ron and I got together, actually. And that was kind of an accident because one of my other dad's students didn't show up. And then Ron was there and we started becoming training partners. And then later on, the rest is history. We fell in love. And you know, he never told day. you that he made that other guy disappear. Right. So that he could <laughs> he be got there. rid of him intentionally. <laughs> just so you They'll know. never find the body. <laughs> about that. Yeah. <laughs> He's, he told us that off air last time he was on. Oh, that's my... No. Yeah. Um, but this is something... Okay, so with... I mean, especially with young women and, and young girls and even adult women, one thing that I run into is some... Like, I have some female students that are just bruisers from the get-go. Like, they have this, like, I want to get in there. And I, they just have this aggressive streak to them. My yeah. daughters are girly girls. Pansies? Which I don't... Not pans. Okay, oh, yeah, they're pansies. Oh, pansies. But here's the, so, which is amazing to me because I mean, they see me getting the crap kicked out of me all the time. I've always got bruises and, you know, we've been, they've been working since they were three years old, but getting them used to in like dealing with physical, controlled physical pain, but physical pain. And and that's something that's really challenging. I mean, because you were talking about sitting at IHOP and doing these little, you know, doing little knife drills and disarms. But how did you get eased into actually dealing with pain? Like sparring and... and well, sparring, sparring, anything. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about being bullied. I mean, you can learn all the martial arts you That's want. That's what really drove me over. I was like, I need to know something because I did not like that feeling. That When I, you got I bullied. Yeah, when I got bullied. Because yeah. That hurt even more mm-hmm. to me. And I thought, I should know more. <laughs> you know? So it almost um, took like an outside uncontrolled force coming yeah. in. To, to really bring me there. Yeah, exactly. And so, so. did it start like at that age? Because you said, how old were you when that happened? That was six. That was yeah. six. And so I, after I, six years old, you were a little it, bit more open I, to? I little, yeah, and I literally had these girls like rip my face with their nails. Oof. And I, oh yeah, I had scars for a while. And I just, I, you know, that feeling that I got, I'm like, wow, I now I really need to take seriously what my father is telling me. Yeah. The other thing too is... Um, what helped me growing up is my dad gave me female role models. I didn't, you know, you have to remember, um, this was the 60s, no, excuse me, the 70s. And I didn't, there weren't really female martial artists on the radar. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, the martial arts industry in itself was still in its infancy. Mm-hmm. And so my dad, I'm so proud that he did this because you got to remember, my dad was a history teacher. So what what did he do? He would get out the history books. And he would teach me about female uh, warriors, female leaders, female uh, generals um, from all different cultures. And so that's when I became aware that women have served beside men uh, to protect their villages, their countries, their nations. Um, And so that also helped build an archetype in here because I find sometimes women do they need role models um even you think about it wonder woman is an archetype for Mm. young girls right now you know and all the other female heroes out there and just as for little boys they have superman and batman right Mm. i mean archetypes are a real thing that is necessary you know um i'm it it sounds like i'm going to go off track but literature you know going back thousands of years all the way to you know back to greek mythology i mean we we do share over and over in telling stories. And why do we tell stories? It's because hopefully it might bring out something in us that we mm-hmm. can relate to, maybe to uh, aspire to. So my father would point out, um, you know, not just Joan of Arc, but, you know, all over the Philippines, there were female leaders, uh, warriors, they were, you know, Mulan. Who was, who was the oh. woman that was famous for, uh, She w- I can't remember what war it was, I just, I remember this story of this woman who was famous for, she had this technique with, with her knife, like her whole thing was she would go up and grab soldiers in the middle of the night and, and her whole thing was she would sneak up on them and cut their throats. <laughs> there was, oh, gosh. She's Filipino, there's right? There's a few of them, yeah. Yeah, there's a few of them. I mean, uh, I... 
one one warrior, female warrior that always uh, mesmerized me was Bodhika, or sometimes they call her Bodhisattva, who was a Celtic warrior queen who stood up to the Romans, you know? Yeah, that's right. My mom's Irish, so I, I think that's why my dad was Yes. Like, oh. I'm full-blooded Irish, man. I love it. Irish and Filipino, I feel like this, this interview was meant to be. <laughs> yeah, right? But it's kind of funny because, um, you know, my, there's always a joke that I am from island people, Irish and Filipino, you know. So anyway, um, but my dad really felt it was strong, uh, felt strongly that I needed to know my own roots. So he would start by saying, well, uh, you know, these are different, you know, warriors from France and, you know, Ireland. And, you know, yeah. it was just, it was really well, you have to almost delve into history because a lot of the role models that are put forward to women now are horrible. I mean, it's this like princess mentality where you, you have this like detached from any sense of reality, you know, female protagonist that has, you know, no sense of up, down, left or right. Or you have the 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 the, the socialite type of woman that that her whole thing is how many followers does she have on Instagram and how tight of clothes can she wear? And, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that's what's like if, if you don't take control over it and present your your daughters with these positive archetypes. Society will fill them with other stuff, and it, it's oh, absolutely, and especially in the inter, you know the the age of the internet. My goodness, I mean, you just, um, you know, you're competing with a lot of uh, you know. Let's it, what is I heard? I think Bill Maher say it perfectly. He says where truth and lies, you know, a blend, and it and that's it's a little scary to me to be honest with you because um, I have people that will write me or say things to me because they've learned certain things off the internet. I'm like, no, that didn't happen. That's not true. So I can only imagine what, you know, our young, a younger generation like Generation Z and the millennials are being confronted with, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but you're right. I, I do think this is where parents can be proactive and, and present positive role models, you yeah. know, and, and it's hard to now though, too, because it's not, we're, we're not necessarily, I mean, with, I mean, with exception, of course, in the one income household. So you have two parents that are having to work, which limits the amount of time you get to spend with yeah. your children actually teaching them. So, so much of the education process is being handed over to a third party. I mean, yeah. you're taking your kids to a public school, then they come home and they're on their phones or they're on their computer, which thankfully we're pretty careful about with our kids that they don't, you know, we don't do and it's hard to compete with a you know with the computer and the video games. It's it's rough. Yeah, I am not so anywhere near as interesting. Minutes. Yeah, I'm not anywhere near as interesting as Minecraft apparently. But, <laughs> You're not. You know, no, I'm it's not. Lost. No. Um, I see a bunch of stuff happening in the oh, comments yeah, no, section. Oh, it's blowing up like crazy. Okay, it's do we crazy. have some questions? Let's crazy, throw them up. Crazy. All right. So, uh, let me see. This first one is kind of long. But it's from Clive Turner. Ooh, Mr. Clive. And he said, hi, Jake. I will do my best to tune in live. But if life take over and I miss the beginning, please could you thank the Inosanto family for me as they are the closest thing we have to royalty. And they are all Ooh. perfect ambassadors for martial arts. Also, would you mind asking Diana? I heard many years ago that the scene with her dad and Steven Seagal out for justice was really her hands working the sticks around Seagal's body. As suddenly this big man grows gracefully and deadly... Thank you for sharing and inspiring us all. Train hard, but train smart, and have an amazing Christmas and a safe New Year, Mr. Clive. LOL. Uh, well, uh, well, remember how I told you sometimes the internet? I, I don't know where you got the information, Clive, but no, uh, that wasn't me. And uh, Stephen and my dad go back all the way to the 60s when Stephen was just a young man. And uh, Stephen, in his own right, is very talented. Uh, I know there are some people that may look at him only as a movie star, but Stephen, for years, for decades, was a martial artist even before he became a star. In fact, my dad knew he would become a major deal, and um, and sure enough, he did. So, um, but yeah, that wasn't me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to clear it up. See, now we know. Yeah. Now we know. All right, next one. Well, apparently he just oh. has very beautiful hands. So that's that's why people just thought that <laughs> maybe some painted <laughs> fingernails or something. What's your Ron told you too? I mean, they, they've worked out together. And yeah, Stephen's quite impressive. So Well, this is, okay, so on the same note of Stephen Seagal, because like you were saying, I think, um, and, and, and I might have fallen victim to this too, um, I, 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 I see... Like interviews with him, and I see the demonstrations he's done while he's in Russia. And, you know, I think people get this idea about him as a martial artist. 
And, you know, like we've heard stories of of him, you know, kind of being a little bit too rough with his stunt people and things like yeah. that. I mean, yeah. is there any I mean, he comes from a really deep martial arts background, but as a person and you knowing him and having such a background, what's your honest opinion of of his skill as an actual martial artist? Because I know a lot of people because he he tends to with his attitude take credit for a lot of things, you know, so he'll say, I taught this person this and that, which it might be totally true. I don't know if it's not, but I think his attitude sometimes lets people speculate, you know? Yeah. Well, first of all, I get, I, I, get, I, I would like to say, you know, because I was a stunt woman for many years, being a stunt person, no matter who you have a, a fight scene with, it can be a rough deal. Mm. Okay. Um, so second of all, the Steven Seagal that my family knows, um, you know, he's an amazing Aikido man. Um, the Stephen I know, uh, you know, is um, very charitable. Like I have an autistic son, and so Stephen has been great about donating. Um, he also works. A lot of people don't know this. He cares about the environment. Um, he cares about animals. Uh, he's given to charities, and he doesn't talk about it. Um, if he does have an attitude, I will say this: um, being around somebody like Stephen and other huge stars. I will say I was stunned when I could be with his wife and at and that time his one son who was like four or five and people will just surround him. And I'm not even joking, 40, 50 people and they're taking pictures. I have seen people just literally grab him and say, hey, take a picture with me. And it's some woman. And that's you know, hard to and deal with. It's because he hasn't oh, punched yeah. anybody in public. You need yeah. and, <laughs> and someone comes I, up and grabs you. You punch him right. and it I stops. Mean, and that's overwhelming. I've seen people start fights with Steven and he's had to be quiet and take it. And I, you know, maybe this is a you know, side of Steven that maybe isn't going to be fun to listen to because it's not exciting, you know, but because I know of all the gossip and the rumors, but the Steven that I saw, I mean, I've, I, I can see where it just gets overwhelming. Um, and the fact that people don't even care that his own family's there and they're trying to start with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it's I it's horrific in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I you know one time I remember his son had a fever and people and he started throwing up and people were just taking pictures and laughing and you, it's almost like you become you feel like a fish like a sideshow almost <laughs> like a sideshow and yeah. people and it's not like he can go and hide because he's so tall. Yeah, so, he's pretty recognizable. He's pretty he recognizable. Out. Yeah, he does, and and so it's and it's hard. People don't see this part of stardom, you know, um, it's so easy because we have such a machinery, a system, a process out there, whether it's on the internet or entertainment news. And it's about getting people, to, you know, to chime, you know, to, you know, zone in focus and get the ratings, you know, and, they want to uh, catch them at their worst moments because that's what oh, gets yeah. the ratings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, so I've, I, but this is the way I, I, I see this sometimes even with my father and my, my godfather, people say things. And I'm like, that is just, it's not true. And, and, and you have to ask, you have to ask yourself, do, is there a, a need for people to want to believe this? You know, why do they need to believe this? You know, and, and you, you know, the hard part is you can't control what people believe. You mm-hmm. just hope that maybe they can critically think and maybe, give you, you know, the benefit of a doubt. You have far too much faith in humanity. (laughs) (laughs) Have you been on Facebook? Do you not see what's going on? Well, okay. So I I actually had to change Facebook for myself. Um, There are certain, you know, in the early stages of Facebook, I would just let anybody in, but now I'm much more, um, much more uh, strict about who I allow contact with. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm Instagram, a little bit more of an open book, but even then I'm very concerned because I've had, some you know weird people try to contact me. I've had death threats and and I'm what? not even. Oh like, my god! Why? Oh, Why yeah. would someone want to send you a death threat? That makes no well, sense. The sensei. <laughs> even uh, then, that's just I don't know. That's crazy. Oh yeah, no, I had death threats because I wrote a movie about a gay teenager who learns martial arts and he's living in small town Colorado during the time. Unacceptable! <laughs> Unacceptable! <laughs> tough and i was stunned and you know now you more people you can do more but back then like this was let's see what was it um when the sensei came out it was like 2010 officially that it was you know out there and now they're relaunching it on fandango now i know I, I, we were going to discuss this so throw I'm it up say, throw it up yeah. <laughs> we got it so, there you it's go. right there so 
Fandango now and Amazon Prime are relaunching the Sensei to a new generation. Um, I'm very proud of it. We got great reviews. We played at a lot of film festivals. And um, I love it because people reach out and they say, listen, I have, you know, uh, students or I have a son or a child who's had it pretty tough and um, they're part of the LGBT community. And I was so happy that we found your your project. And um, but 10 years ago, oh, my gosh, um, it was kind of tough. You know, people were stunned that I would do this kind of movie. And um, the reason why I felt compelled to write the story is as a martial arts teacher, and especially being someone who's half white and half Asian, you know, I, I know what it's like to deal uh, with prejudice, um, to have people not want to serve you or to make you feel like you're different. And I noticed that a couple of the schools that I would visit would not allow somebody that was gay because either one, they felt, oh, this is weird. Or number two, they were afraid that, especially if they lived in a small community, that maybe there would be repercussions about having um, a gay student. And I said, wow, this feels like um, one of the, you know, the last frontiers that we had to deal with when it comes to bigotry. Mm. Um, I also have family members that are gay and I've seen what they've had to go through. And, um, I just felt I need to be brave enough and, and, and try to say something, you know, that the arts, um, the martial arts can serve as a vehicle of good and teach people how to protect themselves. And, I was especially compelled after the Matthew Shepard incident. Um, and I, are you familiar with the Matthew I Shepard? I haven't heard case? of it, no. So in mo- a couple of museums now, like Museum of Tolerance here in, L- in Los Angeles, um, there is an exhibition about Matthew Shepard. Uh, Matthew was a young college student in Wyoming that was kidnapped and beaten brutally and left on a fence to, ha- uh, to hang, and, and he, was, he died. And it was the first major case on a huge national level and actually international level that captured the attention of the world about what the gay community goes through. And, um, and I just started thinking about my own relatives and I said, enough is enough. And, and so I started working on writing the script called the sensei and, um, I'm glad I did. I, I, it's led me on a path to where I was all of a sudden meeting people like uh, John Lewis, who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I ended up meeting uh, Judy Shepard, the mother of Matthew Shepard, because she has a foundation and they are quite politically active. And I ended up uh, going to Washington, D.C., getting an award, uh, the American Courage Award, actually, and um, just meeting incredible people, movers and shakers that have tried to um, you know, change policy to where it was against the law. So uh, during the time that my movie came out, um, there were uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, who was still alive, and um, another uh, senator were working on the Hate Crimes Bill Act. And around the time that um, my movie was released, they actually recommended it with the Laramie Project and oh, wow. some other films, Boys Don't Cry. So I felt very honored. And then uh, the Hate Crimes Bill Act was later on uh, signed into law by President Obama. So it's amazing what, you know, what a movie can say about society and, and who it can reach. And, um, I just felt that the timing was right. And the fact that it's being relaunched again, um, it will reach UK officially, it will reach Canada officially. And they're talking about, um, other, uh, territories. So was this the first, uh, full length feature that you wrote? Yes, yes. Um, I had worked for many years as a stunt woman. Um, I started off, honestly, on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, mm-hmm. doubling for several killer. And then with you know each set that I was on, I, I treated it like a school. I treated it like my own personal university. And I would watch, um, I worked with amazing directors and producers, and I would just stand to the side of the set and I would take notes and I would watch all these amazing directors from John Wu, uh, Chris Columbus, who worked uh, on Harry Potter. I mean, you name it. I was, you got to uh, work with, or at least watch Clint Eastwood. I had read that summer, right? I didn't, I I had auditioned for a million dollar baby. I, I ended up helping my friend, let's see Riker get the job. There you go. (laughs) And um, yeah, man. And she was so awesome. She knew I was getting ready to direct my film and she goes, I want you to come to the set and meet Clint and Morgan and Hillary and, it was just, uh, and the producers, and it was just awesome because I would ask questions and it, it helped prepare me to not only direct, but, you know, act as well. Because that's kind of a challenge when you're wearing all these hats yeah. on the set. 
And um, I had a theater background before, so I was prepared to act, but to try to do all these different moving parts. At the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the same time. Um, Did you go to any type of a film school or university for that? Um, I studied acting for many years. Uh, um, I started actually uh, with a gentleman by the name of Math, uh, not Math, excuse me, uh, Michael Shortliff, who at the time was a huge Broadway casting director and who studied, uh, who discovered Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino. So my dad's uh, sister, who was an actress, said, I want you to, I think you should study with people from Broadway to at least have a really strong foundation in acting and understand some of the guideposts of, 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 you know, creating a character. And that kind of crossed over into writing and directing. So I always had that in my background. I was involved with other theater companies eventually through time. And, and then, you know, where I could, I would have an a acting gig here and there. But, you know, it's kind of hard to cast for my type back then. Uh-huh. Because, you know, I'm, even though I'm half Asian, half white, you know, I'm not Asian enough for a role maybe or not white enough for a role. But for some reason, as a stunt woman, I was working you all the perfect. time. Yeah, I could just double for anybody. I could well, the re- the yeah. reason I ask is because I I know so many people that they 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 put themselves in such crippling debt to go to film school and to get a degree through a film yeah. school. And I did the complete opposite. I moved out to California and I and I started doing little. I mean, I I never made it huge because I got to a point where I was doing indie films and things like that. And then I just I didn't like what I was seeing and I and I left and decided to go into a different realm. But right. I learned more from like you were saying, being on set and being on set and going up to the DP and going, you know, how are you framing this? How is this, how is this getting lit? And I would try to not irritate people, but to learn as much as I possibly. And I learned so much more from yeah. that. And then I didn't end up with forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of debt afterwards. In fact, I got a paycheck. Yeah, that was a smart move, honestly. Um, I, I, you know, I, it's hard because you think about it statistically. It's so rare, I mean, and not to say that people don't cross over, but even now in this day and age, I mean, they're now taking people who are from the game world to direct, Mm -hmm. from animation. You just never know the path to directing. Film school isn't the only path. And frankly, uh, what I would recommend if you're going to go to, you know, school and want to be in the entertainment field, I would learn the gaming world before I would go to, you know, learn to be a director. Learn the gaming world? The gaming world, video game. Oh, yeah. That's the way it is. Everybody's That's the way doing is. that now. Wait, oh, yeah. what? How does that like? I, 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 I. This is the first time I've heard this. So, like, what do you mean, like, creating video games, or just some guy in his parents' basement that just is really good at Halo? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, the gaming world. Do you know how many people are recruited out of the gaming world into? You, you will work more often, and a lot of times those skills can cross over. That create the games. We're not talking about the playing games while eating pizza and drinking That's copious amounts of Mountain Dew. If that was yes. the case, I'd be yes. awesome. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, that is something that I am... Okay, that makes sense because video games have become so much more cinematic. Like, they're little feature films within the context of a game. Yeah, I've had a few friends that have worked on... Uh, that work quite a bit on... Um, on the, you know, in the gaming world, you know, um, where they're, they're wearing the little dots and they're doing the action. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, and animation is another way. I, I my, my producing partner, uh, Tarek Heitman, who's also uh, manages people in the animation world. I mean, you can, I can tell you right now, I mean, uh, they, they recruit people in the animation world too that can make the transition. It just, mm-hmm. it just depends. I mean, you have to have a vision, a story. You have to be able, you know, have something that really can cross over yeah. and, and and so um you know so you don't i guess what i'm saying is bottom line you don't necessarily need to go to film school anymore and right be, get that you well know, it seems like other- the type of person you are and the amount of drive you have to make stuff happens counts for more than anything else i had the opportunity like years ago um uh, I was introduced to Bob Wagner, who was the assistant director for Fight Club and Seven and, the, and those types of things. And I was I was geeking out because I loved Fight Club. That came out around the time. The, I was like in, you know, kind of late teens and it just resonated I'm with me. I'm glad you mentioned Fight Club because one of my dad's students, Damon Carr, was the, the choreographer. Uh, no fight way. choreographer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? my, my dad has produced so many people now that that are... My dad's fingerprint through these people. I mean, John Wick, uh, you know, my, you can see my husband. He's working with Steven. But mm-hmm. you got Damon Carl, who worked Wonder Woman, Fight Club. I mean, yeah. uh, Black Panther. 
Mm -hmm. A lot of those people are all students that come from Everything the Inosun Inosun Academy of Martial Dan Arts. Inosanto. Yeah. Well, I, okay, yeah. so I've got a bunch more stuff I want to ask you, but we got to take our first break. Um, we went a little bit over time. So everybody that's watching, stay tuned. Uh, drop your questions in when we come back. I see just a ton of questions, so oh, we're going we to <laughs> we're have to start getting to them. But uh, stay tuned. We're going to play a little clip of um, your, your, your stint on Man at Arms. And uh, when we get back, we'll get to your questions. Stay tuned. All right. On the next episode of Man at Arms, Art of War. This is a headhunter sword, and it can cut... Let's do this. Our team of experts test their metal with the blades of the Philippines, the otherworldly Khalees. Look at this blade. And the lethal Campilan. We're going to chop some heads off. Stay sharp. Man at Arms, Art of War. Hosted by Danny Trejo. Die! Catch up on last week's episode on Video On Demand. Visit lraynetwork.com to check availability in your area. All right, we are back. Okay, um, so Man at Arms, what? How did how did that come to pass? Oh yeah, so Man at Arms, and this season's called Art of War. Is a um, it was created actually originally on Defy Media, um, and then somehow Robert Rodriguez started hearing about it in all the the circle of producers that he works with, and and you know Robert Rodriguez you know, has now created a network called the L Ray network. And, um, from what I understand, he made an offer like, Hey, let's bring man at arms and put this on, on L Ray network. And they made, um, Danny, Danny Trejo, the, the lead in this, the, the main host. And so I was asked to come aboard second season. Um, I guest starred on two episodes, but what I was really thrilled about was the finale episode. Cause they did the, did this whole thing to machete you know, because oh, Danny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the cool thing is uh, Robert Rodriguez and his son Rubble were going to be on it. And uh, it just felt, it, and then Kerry, who's, um, the, I call him the soulful sword maker, along with his whole team. Um, there's Matt. Um, they, they they just, they do this beautiful thing where they create weapons that you might have seen in comics or in the gaming world, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, they they talk about how it's been used historically, how we've seen it maybe in pop culture, whether it's video games, comics, TV, movie. And so it was really cool to, to be asked to come aboard. And um, I loved working with Robert, and I loved working with Danny. What was and that like? It, what was it like oh, working with Danny? He's one of the people that I'm like, I want to meet one day just to hang so out cool. with him. You know, I love Danny. Um he comes from such a humble background and kind of what controversial because I think he had been in prison for a while in his younger years. He and then yeah. issues. Yeah, he's evolved and he's a businessman. He's got all kinds of things going on. Ron worked with him on a um, movie with Steven and um, it, it's such a, it's such two degrees of separation because um, the funny thing is both Ron and I also uh, were training uh, Rosa Salsa for Alita Battle Angel, which is coming out. Nice. Yep. And that was, was supposed to be James Cameron's gig, but later on James ended up handing it over to Robert Rodriguez. So it was just kind of weird that all of a sudden I got asked to do Man at Arms and hang out with Robert and Danny and and just talk about, you know, movies and the people we both, you know, all mutually knew. And yeah, it was it's it's it was a cool thing. What can I say? Awesome. It was awesome. Okay, yeah. so I've got I got I want to ask questions, but before I do, I have to force myself. So, what 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 are some of the questions people are putting in? Well, all right, so we've got one here from Mark Rendon. Give me just a second here. I'm, I'm, I can do things. I know. No pressure. Right. <laughs> have a request. Would she please join Ron at Mars Camp in Austin this year? Oh. Your your presence is oh. requested. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. I, you know, it's so funny. Some other people from Austin, Texas also said, oh, when are you coming out to Texas? And uh, I, yes, I would, I would love to come out to, to Austin, Texas. In fact, I, I think I'm just, I need to come out to Texas anyhow, because um, I'm actually producing a movie about the Dallas Cowboys. And so it's, it's that's right. Okay. So that was your, your father worked with the Dallas Cowboys and that's another, what the, 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 the way of the cowboy, right? That's what you're working on. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it started I, for years. I've wanted to, you know, push this 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 project, and um, and oh god, the road to just try to get people to hear me, and the fact that 
um, our producing partner, Tara Keitman, was able to kind of help open those doors along with an, our other producing partner, Sam Slayman. And we ended up, uh, you know, with Matt Jackson and Mark Gordon, who produced Saving Private Ryan with Steven Spielberg. Oh, and wow. I was like, thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was such a difficult road. You know, it's it's a miracle these days to get any project off the ground. So mm -hmm. to be able to tell the story about how my dad worked with the Dallas Cowboys and it, and it was the first to help introduce martial arts into the NFL when, and it was a secret program in 1976. Um, the man that brought him in was a man by the name of Dr. Bob Ward, who was the first sports scientist and uh, conditioning coach for the Dallas Cowboys under Tom Landry. And he was the one that said, I see the connection between martial arts and football. Because when you think about it, it's football is pretty much like the little the little brother brother of, of war. Mm -hmm. And and so instead of, you know, crashing the energy, right, Dr. Bob Ward made the connection that you could help deflect the energy. You probably would understand this as a martial artist. And and Dr. Bob Ward had went to college with my father and through the years had continued on with his martial arts training with dad. And he also knew that my father also played football. My dad, a lot of people don't know that. I didn't know and, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. And in fact, um, my dad had trained football under the godfather of modern martial arts. Um, and and his, um, his, because of this man, my dad was able to go on and and you know get a scholarship go to college and it's weird how all these different events led to him working with the dallas cowboys and um it's a magnificent story um they ended up going to the super bowl uh randy white credits my dad to becoming mvp and so it's wow. uh it's gonna be when, when, is, when is when is the anticipated release well, we're still in development. Um, we finally have a screenplay written by uh, Jeremy Go and um, story written by Diana Linosano and Jeremy, <laughs> but he really had to work the, the screenplay part of it. And then right, right, right now, we are in the process of looking at directors. Okay. So we're, we're so wanting to get this on the ground soon. This is a random question, but uh, my father was Filipino, came from the Philippines. For some odd reason, he came to America, and Dallas Cowboys was his favorite team. Like, win or lose, loved him to death. I didn't know if that was a normal Filipino thing. Was your was you know was your father like totally into the Cowboys even when they were sucking? Like, what, <laughs> what happened? Because I I just I felt this thing when you're making this movie about him being involved with Dallas Cowboys. I was like, ah, oh, my dad would love this. Oh, oh, that's really funny. Um, I I think my dad because because Bob had was already working for the Cowboys. Of course, he was a big fan of the Cowboys. But to be the interesting thing is you have to remember at that time period, Mike Dicka, for instance, was the assistant head coach to Tom Landry. And he went on to work with the Bears. Um, oh, gosh, and I'm, I'm kicking myself in the butt. Uh, the gentleman, Craig, uh, he ended up working with the Broncos. So a lot of football teams started implementing what my dad began yeah. in their own teams because they all started to go off and do their own thing, you know, in the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, I knew the Seattle Seahawks had also implemented this type program. So, and, and in some ways, they're not even using the martial arts terminology. They're using, you know, more sporty, to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, terminology. So the football players of today don't realize that they're doing some form of what we call hubud in Filipino martial arts mm -hmm. or certain aspects of Wing Chun. They just assume, oh, it's just, this is what I've learned, you know, from my coach or from my team members. Well, so and even is, is, that lineage goes to dad. Especially in Pakiti Tertia, because Pakiti Tertia is, is one of the arts that we teach here, but the, the footwork in Pakiti Tertia is very angular. And one of the yeah. things that I hear instructors and even Tuhans, they'll use the football language of like, okay, instead of a takeoff footwork, like right. it's like a juke in foot, you know, in football where you go here and then you switch and go the other direction. You, I like, break left. Yeah, it, yeah, you know, but it's there's a lot of crossover between this very dynamic footwork as far as weapons goes and what's used in sports, right. kind of mainstream sports now, which you didn't see necessarily yeah. back then. Yeah, yeah, and it was and it, it was kind of a slow process. I mean, the Dallas Cowboys for the longest time kept this under wraps. They didn't want anybody to know about this secret program because they didn't. You know, not everybody was on board with it, and not everybody thought it would work. You know, there was a lot of scrutiny, and it was, um, you know, it was kind of uh, an interesting time. My dad could feel the pressure. He could feel that some of the coaches didn't want him around. You know, mm. um, and especially because 
my dad, in order to teach martial arts to somebody, you kind of had to have some sort of contact. And so he would go out on the field and the, the coaches are like, why is he out on the field? <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? What is he doing? You know, and, Flag. But, you know, <laughs> you know, it's totally being unorthodox with everything that was a standard in the cowboy system. Right. And then but my dad had to be out on the field. So there are photos of my dad, you know, you know, with two, you know, uh, two tall Jones and Randy you know, and all the doomsday defense. Cause that's who we focused on the most was the doomsday defense, yeah. you know, on the field and in teaching them. So, <laughs> well, this is something the last time that, that your dad came out to Utah, I went to, uh, to train with him down in, in, in Salt Lake. And I, I ask him this every time. And he always, he always kind of plays it off. Like it's like, I always ask him like, how, how are you so spry and mobile at your, what are you doing? What are you doing to stay, you know, because he'll drop down and be so grappling and all this. Is, I'm in my 30s and I feel like a 90 year old man sometimes because it's just, you know, I'm so beat to hell and I'm always trying to rehab my body. And he goes, oh, no, I have I have this issue and that issue. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. If I can be anywhere near as spry as you in my 80s, like I have won at life. So like, did you pick up tips and tricks from him on how to I mean, from being working in stunt in the stunt profession where you're just getting the tar kicked out of you? Keeping yourself functional? Well, my dad, yeah, for people who are watching, is 82 years old. And I will say this. My dad is a huge advocate in yoga mm. or, or some form of stretching out. He's a huge advocate for Pilates, um, eating right, adjusting and change. Because he used to warn me as I got older and Ron, he says, as you guys get older, your body is going to change. And so you need to make adjustments. You need to learn how to kind of adapt. Um but my dad, I would say, probably does yoga pretty much every day. Mm. Um, he does jujitsu because he likes the jujitsu because he goes, I love it because it works my core. Mm -hmm. I get to roll on my back in a way he says it massages me. And yet I still get to work the art. Um, yeah. So that's part of his creative spin on you know, keeping in shape. And then of course he is perpetually like a kid. You know what I mean? He mm. sees the world. He sees martial arts. Uh, like a child, like he'll t he'll look at any like right now. His big thing is studying right now Cambodian martial arts right now, which is un you know. So he will seek out unusual systems and styles and um, and try to find all those those little diamonds because he feels in his mind that the world should have access for their own growth to what might work for them, which in a way goes back to the philosophy of. Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. And I know people look at Jeet Kune Do as an art and as a system, but ultimately it is, um, it really is a philosophy. And, um, and so kind of that's always been his approach. Yeah. You know? Well, it seems so, like um, the, the, the thing that sets from at least my outside perspective and in, in the few times I've had to train with him is I, I've been involved in martial arts for so long. I have seen the politics just rip systems apart and rip people oh, apart. Oh, that's sad. And, yeah. and, and it, it seems to be because a lot of these grandmasters, they reach this point of a hierarchical pinnacle and they stagnate and they go, now I'm the top and I'm now teaching, but I'm not necessarily learning anymore. And then it seems to like turn them into monsters. I've never heard what? anybody say that about your father because right. he's constantly seeking to put himself outside of his comfort zone. Like even when he started training in jiu-jitsu, we had Mark Denny on the show that was talking about how he first kind of took him. I can't remember the name of the instructor he introduced him to, but he was having a lot of lower back issues and started to get into jiu-jitsu. And it's just, it, it seems like that, that idea of constantly seeking to learn more and to not necessarily be the, the, the be all end all of your system, but to continue <laughs> learning. My dad's a pretty spiritual man to begin with. A lot of people don't know this. Um, he was actually a Bible teacher. I don't know if you know this or not. I didn't. In, in his 60s. Yeah, because my, my grandparents um, were Presbyterians, and they had established like the first Presbyterian Filipino Presbyterian church in Stockton, California. And um, But my dad has always been a spiritual man. And, and by the way, he also studies different faiths and beliefs, and he sees a common thread. Um, my dad... To, in his mind, he doesn't even like to be called a master. He actually cringes inside because mm. he doesn't look at himself that, that way. Um, he's not afraid to wear a white belt. Um, he feels that it's, he, if anything, he looks at the world more as a scientist and as a researcher. 
and maybe more as a coach in some ways. Um, and he enjoys very much sharing that knowledge. And so um, for him, he's never been caught up in wanting to be called a master, you know, of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that I love about my dad. I, you know, he's, it keeps him, you know, um, I think it just keeps him curious and growing. I think that's been his secret. He's, you know, he will grow and learn till the day he dies. Is know? that one of the things that, I mean, has made him such an influential figure? And I mean, and with like with you and everyone else, like you were saying before, like you guys have your fingers in like everything entertainment industry. Most of the things that people are seeing and going that, I mean, the, the reason I say this is because there's so many young people that come to martial arts because they saw this movie or that movie or this show or that show and they grew up on it. And then right. they get involved in, and like, that's in Asanto. That's all his people. Is it that yeah. mindset? I think so, because you're learning to adapt. You don't try to close your off from the other possibilities. You know, mm. I, I think you stop growing when you start saying, no, we only do it this way, this style, this system, that's it. Everybody else is wrong. And I'm amazed I still see that attitude out there. I mean, mm. especially in the day and age, you know. Um, but, uh, and that's not just, in, you know, for martial arts. That's in anything, you know. Um, I think, uh, and, and the interesting thing, too, is my father, um, you know, with his teaching, you know, he's been able to influence the military world. A lot of people don't know that he worked for the Navy SEALs um, and he's worked with the police force, different police forces, um, you know, and then he's got the entertainment branch. He's got the sports branch because of, you know, the Cowboys and, and other, I mean, my God, I've, I've heard of hockey players going to dad and just learning these little things. And, mm -hmm. and um, it's just this wild kind of thread of knowledge that he's been able to apply to all these different industries and these different disciplines and do you feel like there was a lot of pressure put on you being the uh the the daughter of of dan and asanto or did you feel kind of free to be yourself um i would definitely say there was pressure on me because i've actually had people pull stunts on me because they're like oh you're bruce lee's goddaughter or you're dan and asano's daughter and all of a sudden i get somebody swinging or somebody trying to just do something in a class <laughs> People oh, just I, walk up and swing at you. I know you think in martial arts it's about high, you know, it's supposed to be hopefully about higher learning. And then yet it's also a great area where sometimes it congregate, you get a congregation of people with egos. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and for sure. And for whatever reason, they bring whatever issues they have and they try to project that onto people, you know. And it's not just me because I know they're doing this to other people. Oh, yeah. Whatever trying to me, you know, it's translating into other ways, uh, you know, in that person's life. Um, you know, I mean, Ron, Ron has his own stories. My dad has those stories of people yeah. just all of a sudden trying to take sucker punches or take shots, you know, whether they are physically or whether they are verbally, you know, and, um, you just, you do the best you can, but yeah, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, when Brandon was alive, there was a lot of pressure for Brandon being, you know, Bruce Lee's son, you know, mm -hmm. I see this with Shannon, you know, as she tries, um, you know, to focus on building her foundation for her father. Um, but you just hope that, um, you do your best to try to surround yourself with people who, um, are of health, healthy mind body and spirit, you know? Well, and it seems like part of the environment that you're in, there's people that have a variety of skill sets and they don't necessarily attach their sense of self-worth to one thing where a lot of, I think the martial arts community are, well, let's say people that maybe don't, maybe when they came into martial arts, didn't necessarily feel like they had respect yeah. or status or hierarchical position. Sure. And then they work their way up step by step. And then eventually they reach the status and now they're afraid to lose that status. So they view your very existence as a challenge yeah. to them. So they have to, you know, does that make sense? Like that makes sense too. Oh yeah. So, um, but you know, overall, I mean, for the most part, you know, my, my walk as, um, a martial artist or as a martial arts teacher, um, or, or even as a producer or whatever, you know, it's, it's been for the most part, very positive. And when you deal with people that might have difficult personalities, you know, I, I personally believe that you try to, you know, you, you know, you just, you just kind of just let it go and you move on. Of course, now they're going to swing at you. Then you got to defend yourself. Right. You know? 
if you pick you pick your battles carefully. Well, this is something that I'm really curious about because it's something like I said I've been through countless times. I I'm, it, it never stops. Like every time I start in a new system, I go, "Oh, this is refreshing. There's no pressure." And then you reach a certain level and you kind of get to peek into the, all the politics that are going on behind the scenes. And it's really hard to have the 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 separation from it because you do take it personally. You invest your time, you invest your effort. And yeah. I mean, how, from the time you were young, you've been in this world, do you see, I, I always see people asking questions like, should we call this person out? Should we put them in their place? I mean, they're doing all this garbage. We need to, we need to change things or what, but then I see guys like Philip Galinas and, you know, that have been in the industry for so long and they just keep your head down, keep training. It'll get quiet again. I mean, yeah. what's, do, do, that's kind of what my dad's done, you know, um, you know, I could say, I remember back in the, as a kid, people would say certain things. Listen, when my godfather died, oh my God, the politics. Um, and, um, and it was heartbreaking for my dad. And, yeah, you know, he, he just said, you know what, I'm just going to keep focusing on, on what I want to do and not the gossip. And you know what? It was the best thing because it, it ended up opening up other doors. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate that because I realize, and you know, instead of getting distracted by people's gossip or I call them the Iagos of uh, of society, nice. you know, or like the little finger from like from Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah, we get it. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, you know, you're going to find those types out there and you just you do your best to just, you know, you know, just work past it and just mm. keep focusing on what your goals are, you know, and that's what I saw my father do. And look at this. He's 82 years old. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say, and I think it's important to note is my dad, when my godfather died, there was so much politics and people saying, well, Dan and Osana shouldn't be leading this and it should be, you know, this person and that person and which would hurt, you know, and I will say this. My father's always said, when my time comes, when I leave this earth, because I don't want that to happen among my students because he has students all over the world. And you can tell who's more advanced than the, than the next. But he says, I've tried to teach the knowledge as best I could and spread it out. But there will be no error. He does not want there to be an error. I think that's know? the best way but to do it. Because he saw what happened with my godfather and all mm -hmm. the politics. And he just thought, I don't want this, you know. Um, and so he says, you make sure, sweetheart, when my time does come, you know, that you reiterate this, that I never wanted to have an heir. I just want people to just practice the arts, to continue to grow as individuals, to find their own path, their own road. And Well, it seems like love. you're shooting the person in the foot, too. Like, because there's still systems where they, they, they do this, you know, I'm passing it on to my son or to my daughter. It has to stay in the bloodline. Yeah. And it just doesn't yeah. seem like that plays anymore. My daughter does not want that, you know? We're, we're so right. But they feel the pressure because it's just we're past that age. It doesn't seem like that really that flies anymore of because like, we're not in these small little villages anymore. These arts have been spread out across exactly. the globe. So it's exactly. not grandpa to grandson. It's now yeah. there's an entire world of people that are incredibly skilled. So I've seen some systems where it's like my son has to take over. And their son's like 21 years old and has been training for yeah. six years. And then <laughs> what does that do to him? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, that's, you, you, you hit it on the nail, you know, um, and, and it's a different time and a different age, you know, I mean, we're living in the internet age. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're cross, you know, act, you know, interacting with many people, um, like, you know, transportation, my gosh, you know, um, uh, whereas you're right, whereas, you know, in the old days, you know, when we didn't have planes and, you know, ships and all this, uh, on this kind of scale, you know, just be, you know, a village, you mm -hmm. know, and you just handed it down to your, your, your nephew or your, your sibling, your, your children, you know, depending on, um, you know, how each culture, um, works. It's funny in Filipino culture, I don't know if your wife knows this, but, um, my dad said in some cultures, uh, in the Philippines, instead of handing it down to a son, they would sometimes hand it down to the second born son or the daughter. And they felt because psychologically, for the what you know, how there's you know, different psychology supposedly in birth order, yeah. for some reason, tribes they kind of felt no, let it be the second born son or the first born daughter. That Interesting, yeah, isn't that funny how different. Different cultures did certain things. That's the way to yeah. do it, though. I mean, there's they too there's smart. there's too much pressure. It seems like I feel bad for people that find themselves in that position, and it's not just 
it, it's regardless of style, Korean martial arts, Japanese martial arts, I've seen it even with just school owners, not maybe not a system, but like, yeah. you know, your, your, your father is grandmaster so-and-so and they built up this, this network and now you have to come in and take it over. And it's just, it's this whole, this whole thing. Okay. So hold on real quick before I start pontificating, uh, we have one more break we have to take and then... <laughs> When we come back, I promise we will we'll, we'll blitz through the we rest of your questions. questions. We'll get to the Stop questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right. We will be right back. Everybody stay tuned. How did you learn to move like that? He must be great. It's the she. Actually. She? How did that happen? McLean Evans, playing nice song, getting beat up. You look my ass. Yeah, I, I saw that. I thought so. Let's just say women in my family are expected to know their place. Ah! I can't move with that wolf pack. Ah! Put your head on me. Like a father who loves his child, he will punish that child that does not buy by his word. I want you to teach my son. Listen, nobody has to know you're training my son. Nobody. You have the right to defend yourself against hatred and self-hatred. We were in the business of teaching people to protect themselves, so that's what I did. What's wrong with that? He's gay. This is a small town, Karen. Your sister? Bull. Jesus, my God. What's, what's happened? Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's more like, um, I'm trying to say. Not We're back up, by the way, so you're on air. <laughs> oh, really? We're on air. We're no on worries. Air. No worries. Keep going. You're doing good. Name names. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to think of some of the more horrific interviews. Um, it's, it's, I'm trying to think. I can't think right now. They're just. It's more like you just have to make sure that they really have a legitimate passion and they really have it together. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I and where they're going to do a service to whatever it is that you're speaking about. You right. know, if that if that makes sense. So. Yeah, I, you know, I've seen some interviews where it, you know, even with with Ron, we had Sonny Sisson on, and you know, they'll have people that'll have them on that are just like hardcore, like Power Ranger nerds or something, and be like, "Do you remember in episode twelve, season six of you know, like?" That that line that you said. <laughs> so okay, so we're back. Let's let's start throwing up questions. Let's get to it. All them. right. So we have from Ronnie, our good friend Ronnie. Other than your father and uncle Bruce, who are or was your biggest influences in martial arts training? Ooh, um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so my dad was really smart, so he would have different people train with me during my upbringing. So they were like what we call the manong, you would know about this, right? The yeah. uncles or the brothers. Oh yeah, so many. <laughs> people would take me on. So my, my, my second godfather figure was Richard Bastillo. So as a child, I would train in his class. Um, I remember Chris Kent working with me as a child once in a while. Um, Burt Richardson, when I became a teenager, um, would work with me. Um, and then, you know, my dad also wanted me to be able to seek out other arts or systems. So I, I studied wushu of Gary Toy. I um, fencing a little bit with, uh, uh, oh, God, Tony DeLonges. 
uh, who's an amazing European sword fighter. Um, and you might have seen him in Jet Li's movie Fearless. Uh, okay. So I've had different, it's been a, a collage of different people. But women role models, I had a woman by the name of Tanya Lukai, who was Teddy Lukai's wife at the time. She was my first physical role model of a woman. Uh, doing martial arts and she would train with the men and I loved that and then the other woman that later came up um, came down the road and was with my father was Graciela Casillas who was one of the pioneers of, of boxing she was before there was any of the kinds of champions we see today she was the early pioneer so I was nice. very lucky to this that this actually ties into a question that uh, that uh, Mr. Day who's actually a, a somebody that watches the show on a regular basis. He dropped in a question before we started because he wasn't going to be able to catch the live show. Um, he asked if there's any tips for aspiring coaches. Um, he asked who have been the teachers, the, the best teachers and the best students you've ever come across. What did they do that we could emulate to do better? So that kind coaching of in martial arts? Co- yeah, coaching in martial arts. Oh, wow. God, there's so many great people. Of course, I love my husband. My husband is an amazing teacher, and I'm not even just saying that because he's my husband. You're um, such a lucky man, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> no, he really is. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you tell him more. every day, right? So humble. <laughs> no, uh, Good morning, honey. Uh, You're so lucky. <laughs> um, great coaches. Gosh. Um, this is terrible. I'll probably think about this later on. Well, I think um, of it more like his question was more based off of like what attributes do these successful coaches that have brought out the best in people have that 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 the younger generation, the upcoming coaches can emulate. Well, I will tell you what I see that I love um, are coaches or really martial arts teachers or owners that uh, create a safe place um, for the student to fail. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've seen, I've heard of some cases where some of the, I won't say names, but I've heard of terrible cases where sometimes the teachers have allowed either themselves or, or their students to behave in a way that's kind of hostile. And then people don't come back and you, Mm -hmm. you want to create a safe place where people can fail and learn to grow from their mistakes. Yeah. Um, I also, I like things that are somewhat family oriented myself. I, I'm always cautious about egos. So if you see people that are abusive or verbally abusive or verbally abusive of each other, I'm, I'm like, run the other way. You're not yeah. going to get anything really from that. Um, I love, like, for instance, I have a dear friend named uh, Fari Barzazak uh, who has a school called Team Karate Center, and he has a lot of female instructors. And that, to me, I cue in on those things when you see a really healthy uh, ratio of men and women training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I look for that. Um, same thing with one of um, our students who's been with uh, Ron and I for over 20 years named Larry St. Clair out of Austin, Texas. Um, in fact, he has probably more women than men in some cases, but it's a nice, beautiful ratio of men and women learning together. So I cue in on those kinds of things. Um so those are the things I would suggest. You well, know, you like we mentioned before, like when you're talking about politics and things like that and how how and, and I've had other guests on where we've discussed the same issue because it is so common. Um, it takes a certain type of person to know that this is your life, that this is something you're going to do for the rest of your life. And regardless of what an instructor does or what happens in a system, you just go, oh, I'm going to pick up my toys and go play somewhere else then because this is okay. what I'm going to do. A lot of people associate that drama and those issues and those mindsets with the system or with martial arts as a whole and it disillusions them and then they, they quit. And they're done. Uh, I know. Isn't that devastating? I've heard of those kinds of cases. And then I've had people, thank goodness, said, well, I'll give it a try again. And they, they, you know, they, they found either Ron and I or they found somebody else that they felt, you know, really comfortable with in their own community. Mm-hmm. And it, it really, I, all I can say is you have to just kind of use your own intuition and instincts and, and really, you know, um, maybe even read the reviews or talk to other people. Um, but yeah, finding a good martial arts teacher or coach or whatever that creates, uh, and, ha- and is open to, to maybe other, um, other information. I would be a little leery if somebody is like, no, you only can train in my system and our mm-hmm. style yeah. that, that I, I get a little concerned about because that's not the world we work in today. No. Um, and, um, especially when you're talking about combat or street you know street fighting or or somebody home invasion you know you want to be able to 
um, have all the options possible, you know, to, to, to protect yourself. Because when you're a martial arts, that's the ultimate thing is when you're a teacher, all I think about is, am I teaching this right? And will the student be able to use this or teach this to their students to where I know if something happens, they're going to be okay. And, mm-hmm. and that's the ultimate. It's not about how well I look or, mm-hmm. you know, do I look great? How, you know, am I super flexed? It's not <laughs> Or, you know, whatever, do I hit really hard? I mean, it's really about, am I translating information <clears throat> this person is going to take mm-hmm. and that they can use it in case there's a life and death situation? That's what I'm concerned about every time I teach because uh, there's nothing uh, horrific than seeing somebody being absolutely defenseless. But if they have some tools in their trade to where they can protect themselves or their loved ones, then... Well, this is something, so we had we had Lloyd, uh, Lloyd DeYoung on, uh, who's a, a South African, he's doing some work with Mark Denny right now, but um, he lives in Poland currently, and his whole thing, he, he was, uh, the Piper system, and his whole thing was researching uh, gang violence and prison violence and, and, and these, really, like, the most horrific style violent attacks that you can possibly imagine. And he had this really interesting approach on it where instead of going technique, then then the tech, you know, train technique and then the technique falls away into improvisation. He does it backwards where he tries to instill in people this instinctive response and then hone that instinctive response to violence. Into muscle memories, basically. Exactly. Yeah. From the, from the, you know, going, a lot of people, I think they start in the frontal cortex type of thing where we're working on techniques and then try to fit the techniques into the situation where his whole thing was starting with the energy of the situation and then technique comes later and i just thought that was really interesting because it it may it, it i i see so much stuff that it's you know you're going to spend years training in this technique and that technique and you're going to build this huge catalog of things and then you need to somehow be able to differentiate between this person's throwing a straight punch so i need to do this or they're throwing a hook punch and i need to use technique number 12 and this whole improvisational uh method I, I think yeah. is is something that's I, I think it's really going to gain traction. I think as and I see it with the Inosanto system and I see it with everything else is bringing this whole world of different styles and techniques and going, you're the individual. And your dad was the first person I heard say this was everybody's different. You have a different body. You're different than yeah. me. So oh, yeah. I'm going to expose you to all this stuff and you need to have a discerning mind and pick out what's going to work best for you. I think that's really the future of the entire industry. Uh, and it actually goes back to even my godfather's uh, saying, man, the creating individual right. is more important than any established style or system. Mm-hmm. It's something I live by every day. And, um, yeah, and when you're talking about instincts and intuitiveness, because it's like riding a bike. You know, at first you, you, you're you taught, okay, put your foot here, you put your foot there, pedal, pedal fast. And then later on, you know, it, it becomes um, intuitive. Um, I will say it's interesting, like when my husband and I would train some of the celebrities, like we, we trained Aaron Eckhart for I, Frankenstein and Rosa. And it's interesting for me, I don't just teach in the choreography. I, I, I try to give them the art um, to where it's intuitive, instinctive, because all it takes is the person that they're having the fight scene with to be off because they're tired or they're distracted or something happens. And all of a sudden that one angle becomes this angle or accidentally becomes this angle because the person doesn't have, you know, a true understanding of lines. And then you have to be able to instinctively and intuitively pick it up. So I literally like, Oh, um, I ended up, uh, training also a gentleman by the name, uh, Socrates Odo, who also worked with Aaron on, um, uh, I Frankenstein. And I just, I kept reinforcing that you just, you never know if something goes wrong, you want to be able, I want to be able as a teacher to teach them to pick it up in case the angle changes. So we, I would get them to a level where I could throw any angle spontaneously and they would just pick it up. Yeah. And, and that's and, the key. And, I mean, I spent probably 10 years of my early career developing all these skills. I looked great in demos. <laughs> like I looked really good in demos. So good. But then I started working in private security and things like that. And I realized that all these things that I learned that looked really, really good, like I looked solid, all of yeah. a sudden I'm like, ow, I just got punched in the face. <laughs> like yeah, what happened? You know? 
And then it really became it, like it, it, it dawned on me that I'm like, OK, I need to be able to understand why things work, not how, you know, how and why they work as opposed to, you know, this this demonstration style. But OK, so before I keep going on, we have more questions. Let's get to them. We sorry. Do. We sorry. Do. All right. That's right. Shut up. All right. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> OK, so before we get to the next question, we had a just a post from Taji Nanji. I hope I said that properly, but I said, yes, that's what's up. Hello to my beautiful and beloved sister, the incredible Diana Lee and Asanto. I'm enjoying this podcast and I am so proud of you because you are a role model and a superhero to many as well, men and women alike. Keep on shining and continue to bless the world with your light. Namaste, one love. It was just so beautiful. I had to post it. It's not a question, but it had to come up. All right. So next one. Uh, would like to ask, all right, this is from Justin Fernando, would like to ask what are your personal thoughts and opinions on the different FMA systems out there, advantages or disadvantages, et cetera? Ooh, that's a complicated question. Uh, on the different FMA systems, um, well, it's interesting because my father alone, I, God, I mean, he has 27 influences of, of different Filipino Martial arts. I mean, we're talking the Philippines. They're like 7,000 islands, right? Mm. There's and so every, many. And on every island, what? There are like two to three tribes, mm -hmm. different approaches. Uh, so I can never, tr I would never judge any system. I would just say, again, it goes back to, you know, the individual of what's right mm. for them, you know? Um, uh, and, and you have to figure that out. That's a, such a, I, I just... I mean, my, my goodness, my dad, like, for instance, studied a, um, of a man named John Lacoste who had a huge influence on him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, hold on, son. No, 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 no. <laughs> Ron, where are you? Boy, he's getting trying to come in the house. I'm trying to keep them out. Okay, so you're seeing the Inosanto Santo home life. <laughs> Oh, you guys, you guys know I'm a mom, right? And the dogs, okay. That's what, um, that's what makes it even party. more amazing <laughs> is the fact that you're you're a mom in the midst I'm of all mom. this. And I got dogs, okay. And all dogs. Right. My two dogs are Einstein and Sky. All right, shh, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Ironically, are they very stupid dogs? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Einstein, sit, sit. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> so he listened. Obviously, he's smart. It's good. <laughs> well, okay. So on this same topic, because I know I, I started in uh, Doce Pares, and yeah. the 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 it was just stylistically different. I mean, Doce Pares had a lot of flir you know flourishes, and it was a lot of very active upper body, but a little bit less active in the lower body. And then I got involved in Pakiti Tertia, which was very active in the lower body. And then I, I did some Lacosta with your father, and you know, like you you see these different attributes. There's Lameco, which is very you know, boom, boom, you know, mm -hmm. very you know, hardcore, kind of rigid, kind of like I'm um, like Shrek almost, but right. very effective. And then Balan um, the, the 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 kind of more short in inside blocking and parrying and covering. I mean, they all seem to have their their value, which is why I think like your dad trains in everything because it's like you, how can you really just say this is it? There's there's yeah, so many things. Can't. Can't. And, and and so you just have to be able to just decide as an individual what works. I mean, my gosh. And then, you know, some some systems, you know, maybe more or less focus on on stick. Some eventually focus more on knife, knife and stick, knife and sword, you know. Spear. I mean, there's just uh, and I think that they're all valid. And my father, in a way, has found a way to kind of see the common thread. So I when I was a child, like I recognized right away uh, lines of attack. I think that's very important to understand. And because, you know, sometimes this line of attack is going to, uh, and the answer to that is going to be completely different from this line of attack, or what if it's a thrust or overhead or, you know what I mean? It, that they're all unique and you have to be able to, you know, understand the approaches. So when you're studying all these systems, again, it's, it's like people giving you a, a, a toolbox an, mm -hmm. an option. Um, the other thing too, I think it's also important to be able to train right hand and left hand. I see a lot of people that stay focused on one side and I believe in working both parts of the brain. So, well, it's um, like the difference I, between looking at your tools and trying to find a job to fit the tools or looking at your job and knowing what tools to use for the job. Exactly. Exactly. What, what, what so, other questions we got? Let's, 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 right, let's throw So them. we got one from Kurt. 
Did you ever compete in combat sports when you were a younger martial artist? And no, I didn't. I didn't have the access to that. You're, you're talking about the, the 60s and the 70s, you know, and, the, you know, what was it, point uh, point karate maybe? You're, you're, ta you're talking a whole, a whole world um, that was in its infancy. And um, it's kind of interesting. As a producer, um, I've been trying to... Uh, work on a, a screenplay potentially for TV about the very early roots of martial arts in this country. Mm. Um, and a lot of people don't realize it starts with our military, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, you know, in tournaments, I mean, the, the man that helped really put tournaments, you know, on everybody's radar, we owe a huge thanks to Ed Parker, you know, mm. Ed Parker, really, I don't know where, um, we would be without him, you know, having tournaments or, you know, really putting like my godfather on, on a world stage at the, the Long Beach Championships and yeah. in the 1950s, you know. So, um, in fact, I will say this, and I'm so glad that I'm here on this program because that's the other thing I do see that we're missing in the martial arts world in general. And it doesn't matter what system or style. What I'm seeing is people don't know martial arts roots and history mm. they, they and and i think it's so important i've heard martial artists say like uh, what was they were uh, i can't remember who it was who said that aikido wasn't a real martial arts and joe i'm like well, oh my <laughs> <laughs> it was joe <laughs> it was joe thanks a lot joe what? rogan oh no and I, I i see i didn't know that i i, I, I there's other people i've heard that and and they were maybe a more of a judo background i'm like don't you know that the people in in japan who were you know, the earlier fathers of judo sent, sent some of their people to study Aikido. You know, so the curiosity mm -hmm. to cross exchange knowledge was always there. And I I think that's so important um, rather than than dare judging that, you know, um, you know, some system isn't a true martial art. Um, a lot of people don't know that my godfather studied uh, European swordplay, mm -hmm. you know, and that the fencing is in the footwork, yeah. European swordplay, mm -hmm. you know, so um Understanding history, I think, is, is really important. And, uh, well, it's yeah, funny you brought up the military because I didn't realize this, that my, my great-grandfather, who I, I was fortunate enough to know until I was about seven years old or seven or eight years old when he passed away. But I got to spend my early life with my, my great-grandfather on my mother's side, and he was in World War II. And so I ended up being the. He was a Golden Glove boxer, and you know, had this oh, whole. Wow. And and I I inherited his uh, his dog tags and a couple of things from his time in the military in World War II, and I didn't know this until I was older. I went back and looked that in World War II they were actually introduced to stick fighting, like the the okay. the, the, the the GIs and the, and the Marines and things were introduced to these these styles of, you know, uh, Japanese martial arts and a couple other different styles like judo and and some basic stick stuff like that. And I just thought it was so interesting that completely unbeknownst to me that I ended up kind of carrying on the tradition that my great grandfather started. And I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, even going back to the American occupation of the Philippines, mm -hmm. you know, some of the, you know, in the, in the days of, uh, what was it, gentlemen, I think Corbin, they were taught, you know, they had this kind of mm -hmm. fighting. Yeah. Fight. Yeah. The and Irish then later style. Our mil military was you know, uh, going over to the Philippines, you know, we, we, you could see all of a sudden we went from this to, to, to this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that they say is because of the knife fighting that was going on in the Philippines. So the military, our, our military kind of picked up on that and said, Oh, let's, let's translate this. Yeah. Um, but like my dad was a military man. He was, I don't know uh, if you know this, but he was a 101st and uh, screaming Eagles. And, uh, so a man that had a huge influence on him was a man by the name of Henry Slomansky. And I encourage all of you to look him up um, because uh, he is one of the, the, the really earliest pioneers of really putting martial arts within a, a, um, a systematic way in our military. And so my dad happened to me, they would do, but they did the kind of sparring you can't do today because you get sued for it. I mean, my, we're talking. It's the best kind of sparring, fight isn't it? Club. Yeah. yeah. Like fight club style. I mean, that's, I, I, cause I, when I was doing my research, you know, in order for me to pitch this as a TV show, I was stunned when my dad was opening up, you know, his books and the medical and, and I mean, they, it was, it was like fight club in the military and they would, this is how they train. And then later on, you know, of course, somebody got the idea that, you know, if I ever teach this in a quote martial arts school, I don't think I'm going to be able to keep my students that whole long. Yeah. So, 
you know, you have... But you learn a lot to... about your students that way. I've found yeah. that a lot with, especially female students, it's, it's been a little bit harder to reach because you have the ones that are like, no, I want to come in. I want to, I want to get hit. I want to know what this feels like and I want to learn from it. And then you have the other ones that are like, no, I'd, I'd rather Wrong. just... Just say yeah. that it's okay, but if you don't, yeah. you know, if you don't get hit, you don't understand the repercussions of the hit. You don't know how to come back from that hit. Yeah, you kind of have to take like little baby steps. Sometimes in some systems, um, like in the Philippines, for instance, th there are some systems that start off with weaponry first before they go to empty hand. Mm. So maybe that's the way you work it. You work it backwards. Maybe. I, yeah. I need to try something. I don't know. <laughs> We've had to make it optional because the, the even starting with blade rule sparring or, you know, like we when it comes to weapons, we will do technical sparring first. No contact, yeah. but working on angles and things like that. And then you start with hand hunting and then hand head lead leg. And then you go into the blade rules and then from there, full contact sparring. And certain people will not go past a certain point. And, and I, I don't like to push them into it or anything like that because that'll just ruin it. But the yeah. people that do elect to go into the blade rules and the full contact, it's, it is, it's like fight club, but they get this, like, I'm in it, you know, like they, they, they get this, this passion for it's it a after very that. Primal thing. It is. It's, it's just, you know, like connected to men. You, you feel like you didn't have a good day. Too. You didn't feel like you had a good day unless you leave with bruises, exactly. unless you leave with some good ones. Yeah. yeah, there's some people who love that. Like my husband, he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> he was saying when he was on last time, he goes, you know, you know, being married to my wife, she's she's grown up around this, so I'll come home with black eyes and all beat up, and she'll go, uh, did you take out the garbage? <laughs> you know, like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh, <laughs> uh, boy. L you have to. You have, have real to quick. Let's let's get through the rest of these. I'll I'm going to feel really bad if we don't I get know, to everybody's questions. All right, so oh. we got we got a big one here. Um, I'm probably going to say this wrong. Bear Bade? Hi, Diana. So good to see you. It's been a while. I was wondering about the gendered titles for martial arts instructors. Remember you introducing the Sensei film in Chicago and saying that Sensei was the masculine title and that you had chosen to go with that instead of the female title because people wouldn't know what it was. How do you feel about people using masculine titles in art, martial arts when there are female ones? Do you feel like people are just blind to the rest of the options or shouldn't we be educating people and empowering women? Furthermore, do you know of any gender neutral titles for instructors? Thanks. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So, okay. There's like five That's questions in there. Don't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't stress. So as far as titles, I kind of look at it now like, I, I know it sounds silly and it sounds like I'm going off topic, but today, like I'll see now actresses that say I'm an actor. I, I, I think, you know, people still use the title sensei now and it's becoming more to where men and women use it or sifu. Although I know in Chinese culture, they'll say uh, simo or, um, or um, yeah, simo, um, some of the other female titles. But I think now we're just, we're, we're coming in an era where people can use it both ways. Um, it's funny. Um, in earlier drafts of the sensei, I was thinking of calling it the Sifu because I was trying to decide, do I want a Japanese kind of more cultural setting or do I want more of Chinese? Um, mm. That I remember. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, it's so funny. Like people will call me Sifu or sensei, but I still just, I'm, I'm, I'm happy just being a coach, you know, mm -hmm. um, or just Miss Monsanto. And I think it just depends on the kind of relationship that you have with your students. And, um, um, yeah, I, I mean, I know that might not be a, a great answer, but um, I do feel that now it's kind of exciting that I'm seeing women, too, wearing the Sifu title, wearing the, the, the Sensei title, and it's fine. Yeah. And you know, thank you for remembering that, um, because, yeah, the Sensei, that was the irony, is the character is not given her black belt because she's a female in the storyline. So, anyway, if you watch the movie, you get to see kind of all the different She's going to be areas. upsetting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be screaming the whole well, time. Well, that's the thing what is the like I, I, there, I never felt more free as a practitioner before I, I w when I earned the rank of master, then all of a sudden it's like there's all this pressure. Like you can't make a mistake. You can't like people look at you like, oh, he got hit. Oh, he got like, yeah. you're like, you're supposed to be this deity figure. And it's yeah. like when you're a brown belt, you are so free or a red belt or, before, you know. Right. And that's why I think my dad, I loved how my dad was just completely honest. Like, I am a perpetual student. Mm -hmm. He loves to be the student. And he, he he just, he gets it out of the way. He goes, I love wearing, I you know, if I see something, I'll wear a white belt. You know, I, I will go in as a beginner. And he allows himself to have that freedom to learn. 
Because there's no, I mean, at his level, it's like there's no insecurity. It's not a matter of like, well, if people don't see me wearing the belt and they don't see my resplendent uniform with gold leaf all over it and stuff, then they're not going to know I'm important. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's, that's what it is. I mean, I, I like I, I go to these places and I train with these guys and it's like they have these custom made uniforms with all this resplendent Very stuff rubbish. on it. And I'm like, that doesn't make you any better. You right. get that, right? Like, what is happening here? Yeah, but, exactly. you know, it's like this inner confidence that certain people have that draws you to him. And I love that even though he's been pro- your, your father's been promoted to Tuhan and Sifu and all these other different titles, people just call him Guru Dan or they call him, you know, like in, and that's what he encourages. And I love that. Yeah, exactly. OK, sorry. Next question. Let's blitz through. We're running out of time. You are. <laughs> Whoops. Stop talking. So sorry. Much. Sorry. Whoops. Jeez. Jeez. <clears throat> all right. So this is again from Taji Nanji. Diana, do you still plan on finishing? OK. This is kind of already answered. Do you still plan on finishing the project on your dad and his work with the Dallas Cowboys that led to the Super Bowl championship? Yes, definitely. And still working on it. I heard about this being made long before I even knew that you were the one making it. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, that, you know, I'm one of the producers and um, I'm hoping to that it just what I like is that East meets West story. Mm. And I think that's part of the the cure. You know, nowadays when you make a movie, you have to make make sure that it translates into other countries and other another, you know, cultures. Mm. And so I think. I forgot. I wanted to ask you about this. Okay, so I saw that. uh, What was that movie that came out? It was the Bruce Lee story where he fought the the Chinese martial artist master that came in. And, oh, and I'm watching it and I'm like cringing the entire time because everything I've heard from anybody contradicts this movie. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, man. What was um, it called? I can't I, remember. I, I've conveniently forgot. Exactly. <laughs> we all have. We watched uh, it and Where he literally forgot. did like the crouching tiger, hidden dragon, hover, flying thing at the end. And I'm like, oh, my God, why? Yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, um, authentic at all. And what really makes me cringe is because it's about. Well, it's really more. Of, I guess kind of like about Wong Jockman. And I have my own issues because um, Wong Jockman. They. I. My understanding is they portrayed him more as a holy man. Yes. You know. And and that's that's the furthest thing. And I wish the producers and the writers had reached out to family members and friends of my godfather and 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 because they made him seem like an arrogant ass the entire time like he was this you know and then the monk comes in who is this going to enlighten him and this whole thing it was just horrific from what you know from talking to people that knew anything about it i'm like this is ridiculous it it is and and the hard part is you know the real Mm -hmm. wong jockman you know tried suing my father and linda um a lot of people don't know that historically no and that's I'd love to have told the producers and said, you're going to put this, you're going to project this image of this man. And, and he tried suing my father and Linda and, and this would have been back in gosh, um, early 1990s, I believe it was. And, you know, I, you know, but the interesting thing, when I've talked to my father about this, um, you know, my dad's a pretty forgiving guy, which I'm amazed by, because I was kind of furious by this, you know, given the pet kind of pain that he was trying to put on our family and my dad. And that's, the, that's the female Filipino in you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we don't take shit lately. Like, uh, I, I was kind of, you know, but my dad's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming probably back in the 60s, you know, when you had the elders trying to put pressure on my godfather they were also putting that kind of pressure on Wong Jockman to represent whatever it was they perceived as as their cause. But um, I, I just want people to know that the, the story is just so far removed from the truth. And um, it's, it's unfortunate. I do wish the uh, filmmakers had reached out to somebody. See, that's know. what I wanted. I just wanted to hear it from you exactly. that that story was garbage. Was because garbage. people go like, ah, you don't know. And I'm like, you're right. I don't know. But yeah. I know people that do know. But she oh, knows. No, holy man, and you could you can ask Linda and and, and Shannon, and it just um, it was just a really bad misrepresentation. As far as my godfather being, you know, he could be sometimes hot tempered, as we all can be, you know, because he had, uh, you know, was very passionate about mm-hmm. his his path, and you know, he had to endure a lot back then, you oh, know. Yeah. Uh, as a, a man trying to find his way through American culture and making mm. it into Hollywood and and also being able to, you know, 
in a way to have the right to break the rules because in those days when you studied martial arts you only were supposed to study under one style one system one culture and we're still dealing with that mm-hmm. there's people yeah. that are broken outside but there's still a lot of people that are in it you know i've heard yeah. people say like uh, like jared wahungi is a good friend of mine uh from the ptta and he does a lot of work with special forces and military groups and swat teams and oh, things awesome. but people give him a hard time because he's from New Zealand. He's not Filipino. So how dare you teach Filipino martial arts? You're not Filipino. Oh, I know. I've seen that too. Like with my own husband, you know, I was kind of stunned, you know, because my husband's white or Caucasian. He's not supposed to be entitled to having this knowledge. And I, I just think that's ridiculous. You know, I love that my God, one of my my favorite uh, quotes um, that my godfather had, because he was, his mom was Eurasian. A lot of people don't know that. And mm-hmm. so he was given a hard time when he was growing up in Hong Kong because he was part white. And then, of course, you, you come. he comes to America. And now he's give, being given a hard time because he's Asian, right? Mm-hmm. And I love that he wanted to kind of just get over the whole race thing and, and see that we were all members of one, you know, family. You mm-hmm. know, that under the, under, the, under the sky, under the heavens, we are, you know, we are but one family. And I, I always love that. And you have to remember in the 60s, you know, like my parents marriage uh my godfather's marriage to linda i mean that marriage in those days in the 60s was considered against the law in a lot of states Mm -hmm. you know and it wasn't until uh virginia versus love and the turnover uh against interracial marriage that it, it still took a while even when the supreme court lifted all those prejudices that people didn't lose that in here and so there's you know there there was it's just been a it's been a process and you know so my godfather you know saw a lot and and so i i I like that his big vision is about you know us seeing that we are all part of this global family you know which is very in in line with like dr martin luther king when he talks about you know i have a dream that you know you know children from different cultures can will be holding hands you know Mm. and um that's what it should be now i i feel like people have gotten to I don't know. We've gotten too attached to the the racial issues instead of the fact, especially in America, this is what this country was made for, was to be this collection of multi-races and everybody that couldn't, you know, deal with the oppression in the countries that they were born in and they come to this one. I mean, my, my mom and my dad, they met in Japan. My dad was in a band... My mom was on a date with another person. It's a crazy story, but <laughs> she felt He in was love apparently very good in the with band. With this Filipino like <laughs> band member and they got married and they lived in Japan for 5 years while he, he waited on a citizenship and they moved to America and it was this, this beautiful story at the end of it all. And I, I feel like that. people need to need to embrace that more than the negative. Everybody's just Well, it it needs focused. to be it needs to be a, a racial melting pot, but a cultural unity. I mean, in yeah. the sense of like, it doesn't matter what race you are, but if you believe in liberty and freedom of speech and the ability to air out ideas and communicate, I mean, that, that that's it. The issue is when different cultures come in and don't want to assimilate and they go, no, no, no we're going to chop your hand off or we're going to do this or that. Yeah. I mean, that's a problem. But when, yeah. when it doesn't matter what color you are, it, it just that's one of the things that I feel like we're, we're at least taking strides towards. But at the same time, if you watch the news, you'd think that we're we're in the right, dark ages. Miles apart. Miles that yeah, hasn't I been my not. experience. I'm de- I'm much more optimistic than what I, I hear on the news. Sure, certainly mm. we have problems going on in this country. But I, I just again, I, I think about when I was a child and what I saw growing up in the 60s and 70s. And I'm so encouraged, you mm-hmm. know, by, you know, the, 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 the course that our country for overall, for the most part has, has, has taken. Um, like I said, I, I never want to go back to what I saw as a child and what my parents went through. I mean, yeah. I, I, I remember, remember not, you know, this one woman not wanting to serve my parents cause they were, you know, um, a mixed couple. And, um, and now I just, I'm glad to see that people are like, when they do hear it, people are like, what? That's terrible. You, there's more of an yeah. echo. Of that's yeah. terrible. Where back then, you just, you didn't. You didn't well, that's the thing is personal that. experiences don't line up with what we're seeing. I'm not seeing anybody. I honestly, I, I've met people that have maybe skewed ideas or perspectives that might not be politically incorrect, but I can honestly say that even in private, I have never met people that are like, ooh, he's black. Ooh, he's Asian. You know what I mean? Like I've never met those people. 
So it, it's, you know, like I see all this stuff like, oh, we're racist and this and that. I'm like, I, I haven't seen that because I honestly feel like when people interact with each other, like we're face to face, nobody's going to d- d- just say, oh, your, your opinions are invalid because the, I, I think we're so far past you're that. you're slightly brown. Because you're, yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're <laughs> a little tinted. You're a little tinted. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, sorry, real quick. Let's let. Do we have any more? Let's yes, get to the rest. Well, of the... No, we got a million. Okay, it's sorry. Let's. Okay, like no crazy. more. No more talking. Let's get to them. All right, sorry. Whoops. All right. Oh, so this is a question from David Osborne. Is that a painting by Doctor? I'm gonna. I'm gonna butcher this. Mongi. 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 There we go. Yes. I know words. Good job, and he David. Said, wow. Nicely, Nicely done. Nicely done. He can pick Very. it. He can pick it. But All yes, right. it is. David. Next one. Next one. All right. <laughs> This is from Sean McCarthy. What was it like to be part legacy if Bruce Lee and your mother, Guru Pala, father, Guru Danan Santo, what was the learning experience and environment like? Well, first of all, um, Uncle Bruce was amazing. My mom is actually Sue in El Santo. So my mom represents. There we go. Yeah, so my mom, so uh, Paula is actually my dad's uh, second wife, actually. Um, so. But being around mom and dad, you know, um, it was always interesting. And my mom was always supportive of my father and and helped him with his books. And, you know, she was, you know, a, a force. And they're still good friends to this day. You know, they've always kept a very positive envi- um, relationship. So, That's you know, awesome. it was. Yeah. So That's I don't know if that helps. You can have an a- amicable situation yeah. in that. It's not always easy. (laughs) All right. So next question from Kurt. You spoke earlier about strong female archetypes. Who is the future of martial arts in your mind? Which female martial artist should we have our daughters and sisters look toward? Ooh, wow. I'm going to go with you. We need to go with Diana on this one. Very kind. Um, That's really hard because there's so many amazing female martial artists. Um, One of my personal favorites is Lucille Riker. They call her Lady uh, Tyson, and I love her attitude. Um, it, in fact, there's a documentary about her life that was done in the 1990s. She's the one that actually ended up working on Million Dollar Baby. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yes. and she played a blue bear. She plays actually a villain, but in real life, I mean, she's this incredible, loving woman. Um, she's a, um, actually, and her philosophy is she's a Buddhist, but um, it's amazing how she's been able to uh, practice her spiritual beliefs, her philosophy, and martial arts, and I love her as a role model. She's amazing. So, um, but you know, I, I can't say that there's going to be one woman or queen. I, I just think uh, there are just a, there are a lot of role, female role models. If you look, I'm just glad that there's there's more now than there was. That's right. I mean, yeah. I, but especially in the martial arts industry, I've. I've, I've never done this shorts. before. I'm sorry, real quick. Shorts. Rhea, you got to take this over because I've been holding it this entire time pee, and so. I got to go. So keep asking this. questions. Keep asking questions. Right. This has never so. happened a first in the history of the show. I was doing really good you, you interrupted me. Keep going. But <laughs> as far as 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 far as martial arts, I I have I have looked somewhat. I haven't done as much investigation as I should but at the same time like your name was always at the top of the list as far as females that led this industry and I just it it makes me wonder why there aren't more females leading in the industry as far as popularity just because uh, especially like in the PTT I mean when I went out I was so nervous because everybody there was multiple black belts their military their SWAT team and I went out and I was like yeah I work at a bar. I got a black belt. Yeah. Yay! You know, like I've been in some situations, but I don't have the experience or the training. But everybody was so amazing to me that I can't understand why there's not more females popping I up in the industry. Are there? To be honest with you, I think they are there. The problem is this exposure. Yeah. You know, uh, we, you, and I, when I say exposure, I'm talking media exposure. Yeah. Um, my complaints, and that's not just in the martial arts world. I would say. That's been in. I'm seeing this right now in Hollywood. This is part of what oh, the yeah. environment, a whole, you know, uh, movement's been about. Because, like in Hollywood, when I directed my movie, um, I was one of seven percent of women that had a feature film underneath their belt. Oh that my gosh, great. that's that's, that, that's a nice low level seven percent. Yeah, and so when I told people how dismal the numbers are for women. It, it, it's like it doesn't translate they don't it's almost like they don't believe it and so that's why I think you're seeing this kind of 
backlash where people are women are like you know hear me we're, we're here and mm -hmm. so i think there are women out there they're just not getting the exposure because you know when you see that the media if it's predominantly men they tend to kind of go toward the ratings and then mm -hmm. maybe tend to you know you know are more familiar with you know uh, the heroes that are, you know, men. And I, I think there are there. It's just, it's, it's about those media sites, you know, opening up their, their doors and, and allowing, you know, I, do you feel in. that there's the, that we have like a slight backlash? Now I'm, I believe in the old school feminists. They went through it, they did it, and they wanted it for the right reasons. You know, if you're working in a mine next to a dude, you should get paid just as much as him. But now we have a lot of women that are like, no, I want you to hold the door open for me, and I'm a waitress, and I want to make as much as this guy that works in a mine. No, that's not how it works. If you can do the work, you should have that justification. But at the same time, do you feel that that's kind of had a negative impact as far as the feminism that is true feminism, not well, just the, you know? Yeah, I mean? <laughs> I think what you're asking me, I mean, I think in every region, I've noticed in my travels, when I used to travel around the United States, every region is very unique mm -hmm. and every, every city and, and, and town is unique. So you will find that those the issues that you are in those areas may not be the ones that translate over in an urban area that may be well, you know, uh, may have taught at, um, I'm going to go back to the, just the Hollywood comedian itself, because like I said, it, it, it depends. Um, I definitely, obviously we all want for our daughters, um, to be able to grow up in a world where they will be able to pay, be paid equally or, mm -hmm. and have the same opportunities and options, you know, um, can, can such a movement be exploited for the wrong reasons? Ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do believe though, Overall, I think it's important, though, to know that th these issues are real. You know, yeah. uh, when 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 women are saying I've been, you know, uh, molested, I've been groped in the workplace. I mean, that's a no, no. And I, I can tell you this. I've 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 I have been harassed when I was younger in Hollywood and I didn't even recognize or understand what it was at first. I just knew it was wrong. And I'm I surprised know. you didn't punch anybody. I'm just saying. Well, yeah. Oh, I knew obviously when somebody grabs you, Oh my gosh, you know, it's a different story, but Break an arm. I, 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 I was, I remember I, I was working on a show and I had, um, I was working second unit, which is meaning I wasn't with the main crew, but I had guys saying some inappropriate things. And it wasn't until they found out who I was, that I was Dan and Lasano's daughter and, I knew some of my, you know, some of my dad's students were already working in the Hollywood system. All of a sudden, they just shut up. Everything and changed they, once they found out who your dad was. Yeah, well, <laughs> just... so, there are some people that are conscious that they are trying to get away with something. And and and, and so the moment they kept quiet, I it, it was a realization that there are people that just will try to get away with certain things. And Oh, yeah. Um, but I will say, too, that it's not necessarily a gender thing. I mean, uh oh, did my camera go dead? Your camera did. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's freezing. It's freezing. We're going back to Diana. Hold, okay. Well, you can hear my voice, so okay. we'll keep keep on D Diana. But um, the the thing that I found out was, I mean, being a an Irishman working in a predominantly Korean environment, I, I experienced a lot of 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 poor treatment just because I was. I was sure. not accepted in that realm. And as far as molestation and everything else, when I was a kid, I mean, things happen. I mean, like, I people look at me and they think you're just a white guy. You're a white guy, you don't understand what anything is. It's like, I chose one of the few industries where being a white guy is a disadvantage, you know, and I've had a lot of issues in my life. So it's like, I understand where, where women are coming from as far as, like, yeah. we don't want to be... Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we want to be respected for the same work, but it's like, it's not just gender. There's, there's yeah. always going to be uh, yeah. that type of, of, you know, you're on the outside and we're the inner crew. Not saying that Koreans are racist. I'm not saying that it's just, you know, like the industry that I worked in, it was not an advantage to be a six foot four white <laughs> Irishman. No, it wasn't. I've heard of that, you know, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, what I, I always say is hate is an equal opportunity emotion. Mm -hmm. And, and it's so unfortunately that we have to kind of, you know, rise above it somehow. Oh, and, um, oh, go ahead. No, you're you good. There? You're good. We got you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I've seen it with my husband where I've, I've heard people say things because he's a white martial artist. I'm like, wait a minute, come on, mm -hmm. we're supposed to move past that, you know, and, 
Uh, I loved my, for instance, I'm, I feel so blessed because I, at an early age, had the most amazing role modeling that a young girl could ever have. And that is with my godfather through the Chinatown school. I mean, the world that he created, it looked like um, a mini United Nations. Yeah. I and mean, you had Raymond Al Jabbar there. I remember we had the Haber brothers who were uh, uh, wonderful friends of my parents. They were uh, two Jewish men that had escaped Germany during World War II. Oh I mean, gosh. this was the kind of world that Uncle Bruce had created of people from all different walks. Um, there were um, some um, just some amazing people. And so that was the role modeling I had of what the world should be. That's awesome, uh, though. You know, and I, mean, I was just very to have lucky. those type of, like, you know, Bruce Lee and your dad, such revolutionaries in all of these industries and just this, this world to have as your role models and to grow up and you to become such a revolutionary in your own set is just amazing. That's just amazing oh, to me. Thank you. Do we, we're, we're, we're already it over matter. time. We have two questions. I know we got plenty. To, we got two more questions to get <laughs> to. Is, is my, ca- is my camera back up? We can tell. Yeah, you're back up. Yay. He's here. All right. I'm here. Now we're going to get to the questions though. So we're back on Diana. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> all right. So this is from Mike McLaughlin. Hi, Diana. Which films have most inspired or influenced you as a filmmaker? Oh, wow. Um, as a kid, I love the movie West Side Story. That oh. was actually. Of but course. That, that, I relate. Do, obviously um influenced me gosh there's so many amazing uh films out there um oh my god oh my gosh i love the french connection i love the godfather i love uh citizen kane a lot of the old classics mm. um that's hard i mean there's so many of them and they all all each director i love like a lot of Robert Rodriguez's early stuff because uh, as an indie filmmaker, you know, when you don't have a lot of money, he was able to make it work. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. The El yeah. Mariachi, the first one that he did, it's amazing to see where he started and where he went after that. Yeah. Yeah. But my favorite movie though, uh, which might surprise people is from this German director named uh, Tom Takwer. Uh, Takwer. I'm so, I'm so I'm butchering his name, but he, he did a movie called run Lola run. And it was, yep. no, oh, such that was a good great. movie. Such a good movie. <laughs> Me, that is one of my favorite movies. I can watch that 10 times. It was so good. Yep. All right. So this next question is from Carlos Castro. Are there any other martial arts styles that you're interested in studying besides the ones you have trained in? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know. I I mean, I feel um, it's not so much now. I've seen almost so many different martial arts, and I start to see, like, the crossover, um, you know, um, so it's really more about the expression and how the teacher teaches it. Mm-hmm. So you, does that make sense? Yes. You know, um, so I've been very lucky because if you go to my father's academy, it's like a university of different martial arts, and he's brought in so many people from so many different disciplines. And so um, it's – I suppose if I wanted to really focus on something right now, I would like to spend more time with more of European martial arts. My dad – and that's maybe just because right now, like, my son studies fencing and – Dad and I, we were talking about the Hungarian, you know, fencers and um, versus Italian and, you know, um, mm-hmm. probably a little bit more focus on that. Um, but it's hard to say, you know. It's I just, funny you I, say that because I'm exactly in the same boat right now. We've got some really good HEMA groups out here in Utah. Oh, yeah. And it, I, I've spent my entire career working on Asian martial arts and like, I need to learn some white people stuff, you know, <laughs> like finally, I need to do it, too. you know, but... <laughs> Well, they're amazing, you know. I, I love them. So um, well, and the yeah. fact that they came from most of these guys that have recreated these styles came from a Filipino martial arts background or a Japanese or Korean background, and then they started reading these old texts because as soon as the firearm was invented, this whole the they, the masters didn't pass it down to students anymore. It just kind of fell to the wayside, and needed to be recreated. Yeah. Uh, but even things like Irish martial arts, I was so disconnected from my own cultural heritage. I mean, aside from the shillelagh, I didn't really... <laughs> the shillelagh and whiskey. That's what he me. took. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> the shillelagh and whiskey. brought me the shillelagh as a little girl. He's like, you know your roots. And he brought me the <laughs> 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 well, well, even... I'm only seven years old. I'm like... What do I do with this? <laughs> but like, even the boxing style, like I didn't get... Like when I saw this thing... I was like, what is that pansy ass fighting style? And I didn't realize that they did this so that they could like heel palm the dude so they didn't break their knuckles. I was like, well, that makes sense because you got to go to work tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. You got potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. You need to handle. 
But anyway. <laughs> All right. Do we have any more questions to get that to? That was all the questions. That was the all moment. the questions. All there right. There's a million. Just so you know, there's so many comments <laughs> of support and love and just oh. admiration on here for you. Oh. So oh. I hope you know that. Oh. <laughs> oh I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, on that note, I think this is a good place to uh, to call it for the day. If you want to hang out for a second after we go off uh, sure. off sure. off live here, then we'll we'll chat for a second. But thank you guys, everybody, for watching and dropping in your comments. You made it a really uh, fun experience. Thank you guys so much. Uh, happy Christmas, Merry Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, yeah. Happy New Year, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, this is our Enjoy last it. show of 2018, so we're very happy to have you all here. And uh, stay tuned. We got some good stuff coming your way. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, thank you guys so much for watching the show. I hope you liked it. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the notifications bell, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Marshall Media. Have a good one.